that the last elections five years ago gave the world the extraordinary phenomenon of an election being won by a woman political leader of Italian origin and Roman Catholic faith, Sonia Gandhi, who then made way for a Sikh, Manmohan Singh, to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim, President Abdul Kalam, in a country 81% Hindu. And this... <laughs> When I talked about that example, it's, it's not just about talking about India, it's not propaganda, because ultimately that electoral outcome had nothing to do with the rest of the world. It was essentially India being itself. And ultimately, it seems to me, that always works better than propaganda. Governments aren't very good at telling stories, but people see a society for what it is, and that, it seems to me, is what ultimately will make a difference in today's information era, in today's TED age. So India now is no longer the nationalism of ethnicity or language or religion, because we have every ethnicity known to mankind practically, we have every religion known to mankind, with the possible exception of Shintoism, uh, but that has some Hindu elements somewhere. <laughs> we, we, are, we, have every, we have 23 official languages in our, recognized in our constitution, and those of you who cashed your money here might be surprised to see how many scripts there are on the rupee note spelling out the denominations. Uh, we've got all of that. We don't even have geography uniting us because the natural geography of the subcontinent framed by the mountains and the sea was hacked by the partition with Pakistan in 1947. In fact, you can't even take the name of the country for granted because the name India comes from the river Indus, which flows in Pakistan. But the whole point is that India is the nationalism of an idea. It's an idea of an ever, ever land. Emerging from an ancient civilization, united by a shared history, but sustained above all by pluralist democracy. That is a 21st century story as well as an ancient one. And it's the nationalism of an idea that essentially says you can endure differences of caste, creed, color, culture, cuisine, custom and costume, consonant for that matter, and still rally around a consensus. And the consensus is on the very simple principle that in a diverse, plural democracy like India, you don't really have to agree on everything all the time so long as you agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. <laughs> the great success story of India, a country that so many learned scholars and journalists assume would disintegrate in the 50s and 60s, is that it managed to maintain consensus on how to survive without consensus. <laughs> now that is the India that is emerging into the 21st century. But I do want to make the point that if there is anything worth celebrating about India. It isn't military muscle, economic power. All of that's necessary. But we still have huge amounts of problems to overcome. Uh, somebody said, you know, we are super poor and we're also super power. We can't really be both of those. We have to overcome our poverty. We have to deal with the hardware of development, the ports, the roads, the airports, the, all the infrastructural things we need to do, and the software of development, the human capital, the, the, the need for the ordinary person in India to be able to have a couple of square meals a day, to be able to send his or her children to a decent school and to aspire to work a job that will give them opportunities in their lives that can transform themselves. But it's all taking place, this great adventure of conquering those challenges, those real challenges which none of us can pretend don't exist. But it's all taking place in an open society, in a rich and diverse and plural civilization, in one that is determined to liberate and fulfill the creative energies of its people. That's why India belongs at TED, and that's why TED belongs in India. Thank you very much. <laughs>